times maybe to share some of the difficulties because I think women leaning on women, women understanding the situation that other women are at uh, does make for uh, the development of families and community. And uh, that um, as a church, as uh, St. Andrew's um, uh, parish, if you wish, that as you come together in that environment, an environment, community, an environment, an environment of, um, of or a gathering of people who are believers and, uh, and who know, especially in this pandemic time, that we need, that we're all in this together and therefore we need each other and we need to support each other as, uh, as we move along. Um, the excitement around the Kamala uh, Harris as the vice president elect is one that is that somehow resounds around uh, women's organizations, women's groups, sororities, and all those who've watched the political arena. And um, I saw a wonderful picture the other day. I'm sure many of you may have seen it of all the men who have been vice presidents over the many, many, many years. And then there is a picture of Kamala that's going to be joining that uh, vast number of male vice presidents over the years. Uh, I think she said it nicely, Laurentine, when she said, um, this is a signal to young girls. This is a signal to young women that what is possible and that the possibilities of um, reaching their full potential, that there is nothing you can't do. So when you ask about Kamala, I see that as possibility, as potential, as messages that we can give to our women and to our young, to our young women and girls. I run a center for young women's empowerment and uh, we have the girls from age seven to 17. And, um, and I tell you, we're now closed because of uh, you know, the shutdown, et cetera. But we will have the biggest picture of Kamla that we can find and put up on our bulletin board when the girls come in, that this is you know, the possibility. The possibility is endless. You can be. You know, she was from a single parent uh, family. She was um, raised by a mother who had to encourage, she has checked off all the boxes along the way. And her story is not unlike the story of so many of us um, who are um, struggling in the society and trying to fulfill our goals. Who were the women who, um, who I call mentors? <laughs> We have to go back to Happy Hill, St. George's, Grenada. I see a couple of black faces there. I'm not too sure if any of you are from Grenada or know of Grenada, but um, it's one of the most beautiful islands in the Caribbean. And when I say that, you know, my Jamaican friends say boo. Um, at the same time, um, the area that I grew up in, in, in Grenada, the area called Happy Hill, three miles away from the city. Uh, the families, we grew up in families. And um, my grandmother was the one who took care of myself and my sister because my father died when I was nine months old. And uh, so that supportive network, and again, going back to women jumping in and making sure that the family is taken care of. I heard from her very, very early, you can do it. Where before Obama said you can do it. I heard from my grandmother, you can do it. This is a bright girl. And um, I'm not too sure if any of you are as old as I am, but when I went to elementary school, I'm 83 now, just celebrated my 83rd. Um, they ranked us. Um, you came first in the class, second in the class, third in the class. And so I would come first in the class and she would take my report card and pass it around uh, to the fathers of all of the, uh, the families who were putting envelopes together to send their boys away to school. And she would say, 
did you send, did your boy get marks like this? <laughs> and she was always so proud, so pleased to, to say that um, this girl will go far is something I always heard as I was growing up. I had a number of aunts around. I'm sure there were uncles and other men in the family, but it's the women I remember uh, who were very um, supportive, who were very encouraging and who took the opportunity to ensure that we were all um, educated, that we were all as girls had the ability to go to school. And um, so that love for education came from within the family structure and the, the mentors and the role models I saw within that family environment. I also grew up Catholic and went to um, St. Joseph's Convent High School um, run by Irish nuns. And, um, and Sister Enda was one of the nuns who kind of took me under her wing. She liked bright, energetic young people. And I was one of those that she really took, um, took a liking to. And uh, so she again um, was, when I think back about, you know, mentors or role models as I was growing up, um, she, Sister Enda comes to the, um, to the fore. So vast number and within recent times, all the, the young people around me, I see them, though they're way younger than I am, 10 and 12 and 15, I see them as role models. I see the energy. I wow. see the fact that they have some goals that they want to accomplish, that they're looking for the opportunities and, um, and they're growing up in a world where they need to know each other and respect each other and include each other. And we have all the talks from bullying and, uh, and self-esteem and, and all those, uh, those essential uh, soft skills that they need to have. And so it's hard for me to, to pinpoint one person as a role model. You know, in the political arena, I had people that I looked to because they had the experience and they had the knowledge. And I felt it was important um, that I uh, lean on them because I have always felt that no question is a stupid one. And um, it's better to ask. It's better to see how other people have handled situations and, uh, and learn from that rather than just plowing ahead and making those mistakes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that um, insight about looking to our young people as role models today, too. Often we look to the older generation, but to find the inspiration in the young people around them is really beautiful. From Grenada to Canada to, to becoming a high school principal yourself, um, a lot of inspiration along the way. We wondered what... Um, what inspired you to enter politics and run for election when all that began in your life? How, can you tell us about that? Well, they say that one's entire life is, uh, is, is, is a political message. Um, I grew up knowing people who were engaged uh, in not formal politics, but engaged in activism and advocacy. And I learned very early that um, that one needs to advocate and be an activist around things that one wants to see happen. So when I came to Toronto in 1960, Toronto was a different place and Canada was a different place. Um, you did not see the faces that you see today. Um, and I say this over and over, you may have um, seen it written, um, I keep saying this when I came, we had no charter of rights and freedom that didn't come till 1982. We had no landlord and tenant act so that the landlord can say to me, it's for rent, but not to you. We had no rules around um, hiring practices or promotional opportunities uh, in the workplace. We had nothing that dealt with violence against women. We had nothing that dealt with 
uh, our children's education, school boards uh, were not talking to parents and parent communities. There was just so much that was missing uh, in the society. And yet there were discussions around this just society. Who are we in Canadian society? And I got engaged very, very early with community activism, trying to make things happen. And yet I did quite a bit of study around Mahatma Gandhi and his principles of activism and nonviolence. I spent some time at the Martin Luther King Center uh, in Atlanta with Coretta King and uh, Andrew Young and a few others talking to us about Martin Luther King's principle of nonviolence activism, how you can change systems without uh, without being violent, how you can change the mind and uh, the actions of um, of someone without you know without creating. And one of the things I say all the time for people who know me, we want to win the war. You don't have ammunition to fight every single battle. So pick your uh, pick the issues that you want to go after. And so I never did anything on my own. It was always with others. And so with others, we challenged the system. Uh, in the 60s, the marches, every weekend in Toronto, we had a march, <laughs> a demonstration, we called it, um, whether it was against uh, police uh, um, interaction with community, or it was uh, um, around immigration issues that we want to see some changes, but we were out there as activists, or whether it was testing, that is, a job is put up, and you make the phone call, you go for the job, and this happened to me. Um, you do the test, they tell you you pass the test, and then they said, no, you're not, I was told I was not a good fit for the organization. So there were things like that that one could say because there were no rules um, that, that governed that kind of language and no rules that governed uh, uh, things around, no complaints procedure, no human rights code as we know it today, where you can make the complaints. So it was the activism and the advocacy and the, 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 the marches and the getting with others and, um, and calling out some of the practices. Uh, at the same time, I was moving myself, uh, Karen, through the education system. I knew from very early age that I was going to be a teacher. Um, growing up again in Happy Hill, you'll hear a lot about growing up in Happy Hill if you ask me my story. Growing up in Happy Hill, um, we didn't have television and the only, um, the only radio we had was something called Red Fusion. And again, it's younger people in this thing. Ready Fusion is there is one station and they put boxes in the homes of all of the people and you pay for a box. And so everybody got the same news and everybody got the same thing. So the only thing there was, was the Ready Fusion and it came on certain times. It wasn't all day long, the news time. And um, so we didn't have television to distract. And we did not have all the games and all the, the stuff that, that are distracting to young people. So we used to play school. And I was always the teacher <laughs> when we were playing school. I had all my cousins and everybody else sitting on the ground around me. And I had the paper in my hand. And of course, you had to have the whip. Because <laughs> in those days, if you, you made a mistake, you know, you got things. So I always had the ruler and the paper. So I knew very early that I was going to be a teacher. I came here and I got into education. It was a struggle to get into. I came with Oxford and Cambridge overseas, school certificate, A levels, all of that stuff. And yet I had difficulty um, just getting the forms to fill out to go to teacher's college. And um, there, there were challenges there. And of course, it was the issue of discrimination, systemic discrimination, things built into the system, um, lack of awareness on the part of educators and the part of others as to, and the expectations. I remember being called back two or three times that we used to get uh, this um, test, what's the name of the test called, where um, they give you the IQ kind of score 
and they called me back because my score was outside the whatever and they wanted to, to make sure because there was this perception that this black young woman could not have scored what she scored. So there were things built into the system that I had to overcome. I also realized very, very early um, that in order to make changes, legislation and in the political arena, things have to happen. For example, I'll give you one that's uh, pretty current, the whole issue of you know, husbands or boyfriends stalking the, uh, the women, going to their workplace, doing whatever. You can activate, you can do all the activism around that. But what was able to, to put a stop to that was legislation. You know, you could be charged, you could be arrested, you could go to court, you could be, you, should, you can go to jail, et cetera. So there were certain things I realized very early that legislation was the way. And so I was head of Metro Toronto Housing Authority, um, uh, making sure that uh, those people caught in socioeconomic difficult um, thing could um, find housing and could in some way help to put their lives together realizing that it's municipal policies, it's legislative process, it's all those things that were deterring those women from really moving on with their lives. And so the idea of politics, formal politics, was not really something I felt that I could do or that I wanted to do. I always felt that I was, um, that, I was a policy person. I can write uh, policies. I can be a counselor behind the scenes. I can help individuals get elected. I can, I, you know, I can do all of those things. Because again, remember in those days, it's changing now gradually. In those days, the word politics did not have the right connotation. The, uh, the word politics meant that you were a corrupt, uh, dishonest person. When you re read what was in the media and whatever, you would see kind of the reputation of people who went into politics was not what I felt. I was not a politician. <clears throat> and so when I was, um, when I was asked um, to run, I did as most women do, no, 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 not me, not me. Let, get some, someone else. I'll help them. I'll help them to raise the money. I'll do this. I'll help them campaign. I'll help them make their list, et cetera, et cetera. And so it came back and forth, back and forth. And I was asked by all of the three major political parties um, federally uh, to run. I was also asked to run municipally, et cetera. Um, but when I did make the decision, um, I asked the party for... I said there were two basic things I needed. One, I needed a good campaign manager because I'd never, um, you know, I hadn't been in the arena before. I had no role model out there as a black woman to say, well, here was another black woman who would run and this was how she had put it together. So I said, I would need that. Uh, I would need a really good campaign manager. And secondly, I would need a good a fundraiser because I had no money. Um, yes, 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 yes. And once I said yes, and everything was signed, the party was gone. <laughs> and I was on my own to, uh, together with um, a few friends that I called my kitchen cabinet. We got around my kitchen table on a Saturday morning and did some of the planning and some of the whatnot um, that I was able to run a, a really good campaign that I was able to win against a candidate who was a leadership for the Conservative Party. Um, and um, and uh, was able to, uh, to put together um, a platform that was um, that in, 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 in line with the party and that was supported by uh, the people in Etobicoke Lakeshore. I had to explain to a friend of mine a little while ago that unlike the United States, we don't have any kind of black uh, neighborhoods 
that can support a black uh, woman running. And so I had to be, um, I had to be and uh, receive the support and be supported by uh, people from the wide range of community and faces, you know, the Ukrainians, the Italian, the, um, the Eastern Europeans, those were the major, I think there were less than, less than 500 um, people of African or Caribbean uh, descent in the, in the Etobicoke Lakeshore uh, riding. And, and many of them, and again, when I speak to community, I talk about that. Many of them did not either, they had not taken out citizenship and therefore were not eligible to vote. And they didn't take citizenship because they're going back anytime now. And, um, and uh, many, um, many others um, just were not interested in the whole area of politics. Uh, that changed, that changed with my winning, that changed with, uh, with the fact that, um, that it's possible and it can be possible. And when I see the win, um, Annamie Paul winning now was um, head of the Green Party. And I see um, um, Marcy Ian winning again um, in downtown Toronto. And I see so many women who have put their names forward, who are out there making a difference. I realized that breaking that ground was really signaling that it's possible. Yes. I hear this over and over again in the, you know, you talk about you can, it's possible. <laughs> so yeah. Things are opening up new, new, new horizons. I'm gonna jump right. ahead a bit to when you were in parliament. I think one of oh, your big baby or one of your big babies there was Black History Month. Can you tell us about um, how you how that how you gave birth to that? Where did um, what was the important to you about it? How yeah, what are your continuing hopes and dreams for Black History Month? Well, to tell the story of Black History Month is also to go back. There, uh, by the way, there is, a, there is a, a bird in Africa, and many of you may know of this. You see the, the symbols um, everywhere, called the Sankofa. And the Sankofa is kind of like a bird with the neck um, looking back. Has any of you seen that? Nod your head if you have. <laughs> You know, a bird with the, with the neck of the bird looking back. And uh, the, the, um, the symbolism here is that in order to go forward, you have to know where you're coming from. In order to, um, in order to plan for the future, you have to know the past and you have to situate yourself in the present to make the plans for the future. And so whenever I have to tell a story, I go back almost like the Sankofa, having to go back. Um, as I said, I started early wanting to be a teacher. I came here, I was very successful. By the way, I'm saying all these things, which seems like boast. I grew up in an environment where you don't boast about yourself. You don't tell about, you let other people tell it. But I have learned that you have to, you have to state um, you know, you have to, to do this in this society. And it so it doesn't sound like boasting. It sounds like you enjoy who you are and, you, and what you've done in life. But yeah, but I couldn't, enjoying it. yeah, I couldn't go back to Grenada and start saying, you know, I was a great teacher. <laughs> <laughs> they, they wonder what has happened to her head. <laughs> um, but I was a good teacher. I was an excellent teacher, actually. And um, at the same time, I was, I did stuff and I did things in the classroom that were oftentimes outside of the curriculum modules that's given to you to teach. And so I did a lot of music. And so I would talk about instruments that were not in the school band. And I would talk about different, you know, different modes and different genre and different whatever. But to go back um, to, um, to the question, I was um, a social studies teacher. 
And uh, in teaching the social studies and in finding books and other documents to, to back up what I was teaching, I found nothing in the books about our Aboriginal peoples, about African or Caribbean or Black or anything like that. They just were not there. And so I was making the stuff up. I was finding the things because out in the community, I was socializing and I was being uh, in the community arena with people who had come um, to Toronto from Nova Scotia, knew of their stories. I, I was hanging out with uh, people from the Aboriginal community and I would be hearing their stories. I would be hearing everybody's stories. The groups that were coming, um, you know, coming from different places, moving, and we were all moving together in Toronto. And I thought, why aren't we teaching our young people? Why aren't we doing this? If there was any mention at all, it was along the margin or, um, or as a footnote. And so I started making up and getting information from, uh, from folks and teaching that stuff. But I was always on the edge because if a superintendent, and in those days they used to come and watch you teach and mock you, et cetera. If someone came in and they asked what page I was on and what module I was teaching, I could not point to whatever because it was all, you know, Jean's um, um, curriculum um, development. So when I got to, I always felt that if we acknowledged, if we acknowledged Canadian history in its, in its true sense, the history of all of us, that it would make a difference to community, it would make a difference to the lives of individuals, it would make a difference to how uh, the young people would treat each other would know about each other, the bullying and the teasing and, uh, and the, the lack of self-esteem in some of the young black kids because they didn't, they didn't know their history. They didn't have a sense of who they were and their ancestry, that they had descended from long lines of, of, um, of, of people who had been involved in leadership and, and uh, kings and queens in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and I knew that in the United States, they had Black History Month started by someone called Carter G. Woodson. And uh, that Carter G. Woodson somehow had pushed from put out books about Black people to put out books uh, to have librarians put out books at specific points in time, especially on days that were holiday, the birthdays of, um, of two important uh, historical uh, figures. I knew that the Black porters, the Black men that I knew in Toronto who were working on the trains, because that's the only jobs at the time uh, that they could get working on the railway, and that they were bringing back posters and that the Canadian Association of Negro Women at the time in Toronto were beginning to, you know, to pattern and to follow some of the stuff that was going on in the US. And so when the opportunity came in the Parliament of Canada, when the Ontario Black History Society asked that the federal government do a proclamation to proclaim Black History Month and uh, they were told, and they shared with me, they were told the federal government does not do proclamation and the federal government will not be doing any acknowledgement. And of course, if you are an, an activist and you're told no, you know what you do. You find a way <laughs> to make it happen. And so I explored all the resources that there was in the House of Commons to make this happen. I was told you can do a private member's bill, um, but a private member's bill at the time, and maybe it still is, uh, you do the bill and you take all the time with legal, et cetera, and then it goes into a hat and then it's 
it's picked, it's pulled out of the hat. And I thought, gee, I've been buying lottery tickets, I never win. And the chance of my working so hard, I'm putting it in the hat. <laughs> the, ch my, the chance of it being picked um, uh, was almost uh, next year. So I thought the next, uh, I said, well, what next? Well, you can do a private, uh, you can do a motion. And uh, to do a motion also means that you have to do all the work, of course, but it means that each and every person who is going to be in the house in the specific day, when you put the motion forward, has to agree. And uh, so we got the motion ready and um, checked that there was no precedence. The wording was correct. Got a date, got a time when I can put the motion forward. And so I had to work all of the parties in the house. All of the, I went to Preston Manning first because they were the, um, the opposition at the time. And uh, he said he didn't think that that was something that was of importance. But if I wanted to talk to his members, he wouldn't stop them. Um, I went to uh, the, the Bloc Québécois was the next big um, uh, group in the house. And um, Christian Gagnon said to me when I spoke to her, she said, well, if you would make me a seconder on the, bill, on, on the motion, I will work the Bloc Québécois for you. I was happy for that, Laurentine, because she had, she had the language <laughs> and um, she, she would work uh, the French um, uh, for me. And then I had a good um, ally in Spen Robinson uh, from the NDP and Spen Robinson and I had spent a couple of weeks in South Africa around the time of the Nelson Mandela um, and so we had, um, I went to Spain and I said, would you work the NDP caucus for me? And then I worked my own caucus, um, the liberals. And so when I stood up to put the motion, um, well, maybe I can tell you guys this story because as I'm talking to everybody, trying to bring everybody on side, right? Um, and I go back to the King Center and what I learned at the King Center um, so, Jean, you want Black History Month? Tell me, can I go for White History Month? <laughs> or you want Black History Month? Okay, when is, um, or the other thing would be, um, uh, so you want uh, February, who's going to come for March? And on and on, these provocative things to get you to, you know, to respond. And, um, and as I said earlier, I wanted to win the war and that was to get the motion. So I didn't take the provocation. I smiled, I stuck my tongue neatly in my cheek. I come to 10, I looked down at the floor, I humbled. And I said, okay, well, think about it. <laughs> and, um, and I moved on. In the end, when I put the motion, um, it was, I got unanimous, unanimous consent. So nice. that, wow. What did that feel like? Well, that was, it was almost an alleluia. <laughs> <laughs> it was an, almost an alleluia time. Because, you know, when you put the motion, it's kind of like a little drama, you know? Um, the speaker turns around and says, uh, to the to the entire house, um, does uh, does the member have the consent of the house? I was parliamentary secretary to the prime minister at the time, to Jean Chrétien, and um, the the speaker says, um, does uh, the parliamentary secretary have the unanimous consent of the house to put this motion? And you stand there, and you if and one person said no. <laughs> you know, the game would be over. And so I'm looking at those people who are, pro who are the prov provocative, <laughs> who are the ones that provoke me, you know, and my eyes is just stinging around there. In other words, open your mouth and you're dead. <laughs> but um, 
It wow. was in, it was interesting, and uh, that was twenty five years ago. Wow! And I can tell you, uh, um, Reverend uh, Karen, that Black History Month is celebrated now in just about every place in the land. Yes. In media, in entertainment, in yes. in um, in churches, in schools, in synagogues. I have been, I had an invitation two years ago to um, Fort McMurray. Um, and again, the, the, the celebration there was just incredible. I've been to Nunavut. When I had the invitation from the Black Society of Nunavut, I, I, I had to check to make sure that there were enough Black people in Nunavut to have a Black History <laughs> Society. And uh, had a wonderful time, and they're doing really, really great work. And all throughout, books and text and chapters and things have been written as a result of that motion. That motion, I call it historic, simply because what it did, it gave legislative um, uh, credence to the fact that you can do this. So it's not like when I was in the classroom hiding to do this, but it's, it's yeah. kind of saying, here is a nod, we can do this. The, right. the, the Parliament of Canada has so uh, sanctioned. And um, this has been uh, a, a great journey. And I consider this also uh, a legacy. Uh, yes, and when we look back uh, at this legacy and when we, from all where you are coming from, do you uh, see that the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, are you seeing a momentum that he could you know, contribute or he could benefit of, for the continuation of the Black History Month? Yes, I think that um, black, black Lives Matter as a movement, remember it started really very small and then it has grown and yes. grown. It's now an international um, movement. And I don't think that there is any calling back from that movement. There are some movements that come up and die. I see Black Lives Matter growing because what it has done, especially combined at this um, pandemic time, this reflective time, it's really called to the fore all the systemic things in the society, all the, the discrimination, the racism and other things. And I think combine that with the uh, policing and um, all of us in, in around the world because of social media, watch the killing of, of Floyd. Um, it has just shocked us into what systemic racism is about. And it has also given us the opportunity all around the world in the marches that you've seen, in the youth and the young people who've come out, in the, the corporate leadership, the religious leadership, and all that has, that has been part of the entire discussion to say, where are we? Who are we? Where is that old gospel um, message that we are our brothers or sisters keeper? How do we get that message out? And how do we make sure that everyone is included? And who are we? And we went back to go back again at Sankofa moment that in Canada, we had asked the question, are we just English and French? And we say, no after we had gone all around the country, we came back with the decision that we were a multicultural, multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society. And so if we are who we acclaim that we are, who we see we are as you walk the streets of our cities, as you look at the congregation in your church, as you look at any kind of gathering, whether it's in academia, in you know, universities, wherever, as we look around, we say, this is who we are. So we need to know each other. We need to respect each other. We yes. need to trust each other. Yes. 
And we need to build the kind of, to use Pierre Trudeau's words, the kind of just society. Yeah. And so not only the pandemic that shows us we're all in this together. I was reading a piece this morning about uh, COVID in Madagascar and how they've had no deaths in Madagas Madagascar because they had um, the measles, the MMR, measles, mumps, and what's the R, rubella. The that vaccination that had, uh, seemed to have um, gi given some immunity to a number of to, to folks in that country and on and on and on. But here is, here is a note about a small island wherever talking about COVID, talking about the pandemic. So what it's saying is we're all in this together, folks. And we have to live together and we have to know each other. So all of this issue of the past history, the past wrongs to our First Nations people, the past wrongs to so many as a result of the transatlantic slave trade, the past wrongs that have occurred, we have to examine that and we have to ask ourselves how we can move forward. And maybe this pandemic, the convergence of this with this reflective time, this stay at home time, I live by myself. <laughs> And so there's a lot of time by yourself. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of time to reflect, yeah. to think and to ask and to question our place in this world. One of our sisters, um, uh, writers, talked about the fact that there are, I think, seven point something billion of us in the world. Wow. And each one of us is taking up space. Each one of us is taking up air. Each one of us is using the resources. Each one of us has some place in this, in this, in this world. Mm -hmm. And the question was posed to each individual what are you doing to account for yeah. that space you're taking up, that resource that you're using? Mm -hmm. And so this reflective time gives us the opportunity to read, to think, to say, who is my neighbor? Yes. Who is my neighbor? Yes. And... Uh, I can tell you, when I heard your stories earlier, people talking, and Yvette talked about someone sending her flowers. Yvette, I've had things sent to me from all over the place, from, from people that, you know, for some reason you never think, you know, would be so kind. Yeah. I have one woman who, um, who brings me on a weekly basis Caribbean cooked food, like rice and peas. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, and I have um, Ismaili friends who bring me basmati rice and, and uh, curry, different things, who have added me to their family and added me to, um, as my grandmother used to say, the extra um, bit of water you put in the pot. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and how and how you 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 do that invite, yes. And yeah. in return, I try I make the calls around. I have folks I chat with, yes. And uh, folks yes. I discuss things, yeah. And I pass on some of the funnies. This is and, really uh, yeah. amazing, honorable. And uh, you know, as we are, uh, it is always the case with the challenge of the time. We still have a lot of questions prepared for you, but unfortunately, we will not have that time to, you know, to go through those questions. But we want to give the chance to people that are here to answer you uh, some of their questions. So, 
uh, it's over to you folks. If anybody has a question that wants to ask to Honorable Dr. Jane, please, this is the time now to hear from you. We have about 10 minutes for Q and A's and um, we could close up. Thank you. Yeah, so you okay, can- I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief in my answers. <laughs> you, can, you can type your questions in the chat or you can wave like mad and I will, uh, I will endeavor to- I remember Coco screen. had a question. I remember Coco with Coco, do you want to start? Yes, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Honorable Jean. I am so um, inspired to see you, to meet you, to hear from you. Um, I am, for, for St. Andrews, I'm the church school superintendent. I'm a black woman. I'm an immigrant. I'm a mom. Um, I'm a scientist. These are all of the, my different identities that intersect. Mm -hmm. And um, my question for you is, um, I admire your, your, your um, what's the, is it reticence? I admire your ability to focus on the goal and deal and just ignore all the noise and just go for what is the greater good, which is how you got Black History Month started. And I'm just looking for advice on how um, I could do that in my life. You know, like currently I am the co-chair of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee mm -hmm. um, in my organization at work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, recently every organization is woke. Everybody has statements about how equity means so much to them. Um, but then you look at the board of directors, you look um, at senior management, um, you look at the different committees that are, you know, within mm -hmm. your organization. Mm -hmm. um, I work in a building that's 22 floors. I've worked there for seven years. I've met one other black woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets really weary. It gets really tiring when, when you say one thing and you're clearly doing something else. Um, and I, I really don't want to be jaded. I really want mm -hmm. to um, work towards this common good. Mm -hmm. How do I continue mm -hmm. to, to not, I mean, this is not my day job. My day job is something completely different. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is a committee mm -hmm. that I'm on, mm -hmm. but how do I continue to advocate for, for diversity, for inclusion, for different voices around the table, not just at work, not just in church, not just in my daughter's school, but mm -hmm. in all these different places where you, you know that the people that you're seeing around the table are very different from the people that you know, mm -hmm. and you know that people's voices are not being heard. Mm -hmm. How well, do you Coco, push that's for the, more? Yeah. Coco, that's, that's exactly it. And this is why the conversation starts with the whole issue of leadership. And this is why, you know, um, Karen, Laurentian, just, just um, to be at the top of any organization um, or institution uh, has responsibility. And uh, it has to start right at the top, that in order to make any change, and I see this happening now in this, um, in this pandemic period, that corporate bodies are now talking about promotional opportunities, uh, getting more people on board. I see organizations now looking for uh, conversations around the issue. You would not believe how many diversity and inclusion conversations that I've been engaged with, with uh, people in leadership as they try to understand that the way forward, the way forward. And um, it starts with little things from the, um, when my kids, I have two daughters when they were in school. And in those days they used to make these collages and come home with, with a collage with all kinds of different faces on it. When I realized that there was no black face uh, in any of the collages, I collected all the, the magazine, the black magazine um, that, um, that I had at the time, and I would send it to the teacher. So at least when they were cutting through the magazine, they can at least do the inclusion. Um, again, it's um, when I was uh, asked uh, to be a board member uh, a number of years ago of the, uh, the Catholic Children's Aid Society in Toronto, and I went in for the very first um, kind of interview meeting and I looked around the room and every picture on the wall at the time were pictures of beautiful, blonde, blue-eyed children. 
And I said, these are not the children we serve. Where are some other things? And I said, I will come on the board when you change some of these, uh, these images because I felt that was important. So it's a small thing. It's finding out, it's bringing to their attention because each and every one of us, and I'm sure you all do this, when you walk into a room, you see the faces in the room, you see the ages in the room. Are there young people in here? Are there old people in here? Are there men in here? Are there women in here? Are there people of color in here? Does that reflect the, um, the public spaces in which um, we all operate? So when one is in an organization and one is part, it's not that you don't fight and squabble with people because um, there is that old saying, again, my grandmother, a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So you don't argue and convince against the will or get into arguments, but you begin to show that when you have more voices in here, when you have different voices in, around the table, when you have different people inputting into the discussion, then the discussion is richer. Listening this morning, um, to the, the earlier fellowship. The discussion is rich when it's coming from different areas. Someone who would do something with, um, with, with Africans in terms of some mention, someone who would do, so, you, you can see the richness and you can also see that our world, that we have to change. And this is where the Black Lives Matter and all that discussion in this pandemic time has to move us towards there. And the other that you can do is provide um, readings, provide booklets, provide YouTube um, things so that you yourself have to enrich yourself and you have to make sure that you share that with others and ask them if they want to have a discussion after they've read whatever it is that you brought to their attention. But you have to be proactive. And um, I remember one of the banks invited me when I was minister for multiculturalism. And they took me from the first floor up to the 40 something floor. And first floor, um, or the, the first floor where they, they had a staff, um, I saw a number of the entry level positions. I saw a number of, of black and brown faces by the fourth, the fifth, I think they had all of the, um, the people who deal with, um, with the paperwork, you know, their accountants and stuff like that. Saw some brown faces in there, mainly male. And I kept going up and by the time I got to the 40 something floor, there was not one person of color. And uh, I very nicely pointed that out, you know. Isn't it amazing that, you know, you have no one who, uh, and nowadays this has changed, the banks have now changed, and the banks have now come around to the issue of diversity and inclusion. They were very early on the issue of women, gender, but um, you have to point it out. You have to point it out, yes. not in an angry way, but point it out in an intelligent way. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Dr. James. Uh, we have Natalie who has a question. Please, Natalie, do you want to ask a question? Yes, um, I um, I was on I through various things I'm involved with. I understand that um, there is um, some talk um, amongst um, uh, people of African descent in Ottawa in the music uh, um, air industry, I guess, or uh, young musicians, artists, and cultural people who. I think uh, it would be good for Ottawa to have a Pan-African cultural center or a community center. I was wondering, is this a new thing? Um, is this something that um, um, uh, that, that uh, the Honorable Jean Augustine has heard of? Is this something that, um, uh, I, th I think it's a great uh, idea. Mm -hmm. And I, also I was wondering whether yeah, through whether, the, anyway, this is what my question. Yeah, well, Natalie, I think that 
when young, especially today's young black people, some of them who were caught in, in kind of lifestyle and in, 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 um, in issues that are really not very positive one, it's as a result of not having a grounding in a community and a resource where the mentors are there, where there are programs and where there, is, uh, there are opportunities for them to, to find their place in the society. And, um, and I support, I support um, community organizations, community groups, community centers that focus and give a focus to the issues and, uh, and uh, whether it is uh, the musical, musical talent, the ability to learn, the ability to associate with people who are engaged, people who are, um, who are doing well, people who are models uh, uh, for them and, uh, and a way to have them uh, a place where you can rub shoulders with others and where there is affirmation in that center. So in Toronto, there are several places like that. We just got some funding for a center uh, called the NIA Center that will focus um, on, um, focus on, uh, don't worry about my phone there. I, tried, I thought I turned it off. <laughs> that um, the cent a, a center that would focus on, as you said, the media, and, um, and learning all those skills around the art and, uh, and uh, encouraging uh, the, um, the growth of, um, of those uh, specific skills. So if there is, a, there is an opportunity to have this in Ottawa, I would say let's all assist, let's all support, and let's all participate in that kind of a center in that where role models, mentors, skill development, and, um, and opportunities for young people to, 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 see, um, to see people who are excelling in particular skills. Thank you so much. <laughs> you have I think, oh. Yes, Karen. I think you have given us so much to think about. Um, and such a powerful message of inspiration, possibility. Um, I'm going to email you to find out more about the bird so I spell it right, because I'm going to think about that. I can see myself thinking about that a lot. San, San Kofor, S A N. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Kofa, K O F A. Yeah, to think about a San Kofa moment. I like that. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's quite the invitation for us. Um, and, and moving forward, very full of possibility, and I feel empowered. <laughs> I, I, I hope the rest of you have. have felt that way too. So Joan R Joan River is that the Joan River that I used to know? Um, I don't know. No. Okay. <laughs> where did uh, Where did you know me from? I don't know. Were you a public servant? Yes. Well, I think that's. <laughs> <laughs> I worked at the Department of Justice. Okay. Uh, edit, editing legislation. All right. So maybe we've seen each other's names. That's somewhere. right. You may have come before a committee that I sat on, I guess. I'm not sure, but maybe my name was. Hey, okay. <laughs> wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lauren I think um, we're actually at 1102, which is quite, that went fast. <laughs> Lauren yeah. I'll turn it back to you. Yes, uh, thank you so very much, Honorable Sir Jen Augustine. We are very honored to have had you today. It was a blessing for us. And uh, we want to mention that on behalf of the pastoral care and the Christian education ministry team, we are going to be making a donation to George Brown College Jan Augustine Scholarship. And this scholarship is awarded annually to two deserving single mothers education. Well, so, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, these are young, these are women who had to drop out of school because they got pregnant, or these are young women who've been struggling with um, as single mothers. And it's not a lot of money, but at the same time, 
the scholarship does provide them with an opportunity to, you know, to book to, for their tuition or their books or whatever. So thank you so much, uh, so much for this donation. It will make the lives of two women this year. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. We give glory to God. So we want to pray and close uh, our event. Yes. So let's pray. Dear God, our Lord, we thank you for this moment with Honorable Dr. Jen Augustine. It has been a blessing for each of us here and for our congregation. Thank you very much for this blessing. And we very much hope that you will allow us other opportunities like this to listen to people who are inspiring us and to continue to come together to share our experiences, to share ourselves, to share our love, your love. Thank you to help us to remind that we are the light of the world and may this light continue to shine forever for your glory. As mm -hmm. your word says in Psalm 19, verse 14, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, we pray you. Amen. 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 So thank you all. Have a blessed day. Yes. And don't forget, wash your hands, self-distance. <laughs> Wear your thank mask. You. Yep. <laughs> Wear your mask. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank bye -bye. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you.